Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers, being in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. So we pray that this video serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, that it encourages you, and even challenges you and brings you closer to Jesus. So again, we're super excited that you're checking out this video and we pray that it's a help to you. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for your church, and I think the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. Well, good morning, Brainerd Faith family and guests. It's great to see you as always. Let's study God's word together and continue to worship him that way. Mark chapter four in your Bible. I ask you to open it to that place uh, while you're finding that. Uh, we'll welcome those of you that are joining us online. We're always blessed to have you uh, participate in this. Mark chapter 4, if you don't have a Bible and you're sitting close to someone that does, uh, hopefully they'll let you look on with them, and uh, let's look and see what God has to say uh, to us. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, is going to be sound familiar to some of you. It contains a familiar Bible story. Maybe there's some other parts that won't be as familiar, and we'll We'll learn some things and have a better understanding. Mark is the human author, of course, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so this is God's Word for us. Mark 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and set in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word. It proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. I entitled this message The Conundrum of Christ's Kingdom. You know what a conundrum is? Conundrum is a, a confusing or difficult uh, question or problem 
Or it could be a question that has a, a pun in its answer. Basically, it's a riddle. So you got this, this kind of confusing, difficult problem or question. You got riddle. Both of those, interestingly, are at play in this passage of Scripture. The, the particularly difficult and confusing problem was one that, that had no doubt led a lot of Jesus' disciples to begin asking a question that actually would be asked by his followers all the way through his ministry. And let me just go ahead and say is a question probably some of us have asked in this room today. And that is simply why this guy doing all the stuff that he did, so, so many otherworldly things, all the good that he did, why are so few people embracing him, accepting him? You know that there was lots of people that were following Jesus. We've been talking about that. We talked about it in the last couple of weeks, the crowds that were, were thronging to, to get to Jesus. There's just a, you know, kind of a, a little synopsis of that back over in chapter 3 and verse 7. You know, when it says a great crowd followed him from all of these places, you know, uh, uh, across Israel. And later in verse 8, when the great crowd heard all that was, he was doing, they came to him. And then in verse 9, he told his disciples, have a boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush it. And by the way, that's exactly what's happening here in chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that. Jesus gets in a boat. They row out a little bit. He teaches from the boat. The crowd is standing on the beach. And he teaches them from these parables. And so we know crowds were following him, but remember, just because a crowd is there doesn't mean everybody that's in the crowd has the right motives. Not everybody's authentic. In fact, we've noted the fact that the vast majority of the people that made up those crowds were people that were following him because they wanted something from him. They wanted him to heal them, to cast out a demon. They wanted him to do something about their physical condition, but what they weren't interested in was his message and his identity. They weren't interested in acknowledging their need for a Savior and acknowledging him as the promised Messiah that was to come. And so just because there was a crowd doesn't mean everybody was authentic. You remember last week we talked about this with the excuses people were given. You know, if a guy's doing otherworldly stuff, but yet you're still going to reject him, you got to come up with some explanation for all of this otherworldly stuff that he's doing. So his family was even saying he was crazy. He's off his rocker. Religious leaders, what were they saying? Saying he's demonic. He's possessed by the devil, and he gets his power from the devil. So you got all these crowds, but people were beginning to recognize the fact that not everybody in the crowd was, was there for the right reason. And you got to lose the chapter division here because it seems like right here, this is where Jesus in, you know, he, he, he gives this teaching. He, he, he talks about what he talks about in chapter 4 in response to these crowds coming, crowds in which not everybody was signing up for the right reasons. Now, this conundrum, if you will, is going to continue through Jesus' ministry. Luke chapter 13, for example, one of his followers asked him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? So all the way through his ministry, I mean, even his followers were looking and they were noticing. They were noticing that the number of people that were saying yes in proportion to the number of people that were saying no were not very many. Listen to how Jesus responded. He said, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. That ought to sound familiar to some of you are familiar with Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he said this, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And this is something that's going to characterize Jesus' ministry. The longer he goes, the longer he ministers, the more people are going to be asking this question because the more evidence there's going to be that the number of authentic, genuine believers is relatively small. This really almost comes to a head in John chapter 6 when Jesus says some particularly difficult things about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That got some people's attention, right? 
But Jesus wasn't talking about some satanic ritual or witchcraft. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. He was simply trying to get people to understand that they had to partake of him. They had to embrace him. They had to receive him into their lives if they were going to experience eternal life. This is what John tells us. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Mark that word, listen. Who can hear it? Who can receive it, he says. And then a little bit later, one of the most tragic commentaries in all of Jesus' ministry, John 6, verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back. You get that? Many of his disciples, many of his followers turned back and no longer walked with him. This is what would characterize Jesus' ministry. And by the time he's done, after he's risen from the dead, we've got a reference in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were 500 that gathered in Galilee. After he ascended back into heaven in Jerusalem, we're told there were 120 that gathered in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Do the math on that. 620 uh, people after three and a half years of public ministry in which crowds were thronging to get to him. It's not very many. But listen, some of you have experienced that, haven't you? You've shared the gospel and more have said no that have said yes. You've pleaded with family members who've continued to resist you, somebody on your ball team or at work that you've, you, you've tried to witness to and yet they've continued to, to, to resist. Every once in a while, some, someone says yes. But the number of people that we share the gospel with that actually say yes and are genuine and are authentic and their life proves that out is relatively few. And we can't help along the way but ask the same question that no doubt some of these followers were asking. And that is, (laughs) you see what he's doing? He's healing lepers. He's making food. He's he's, he's multiplying fish and loaves. He's He's teaching with power. He's casting out demons. He's he's, he's causing somebody's limb that's paralyzed to heal. Are you looking at this stuff? You and I have this gospel, this good news that's the only way for people to have their sins forgiven. The story of what Jesus has done. And we know that it's the best news in the universe and we share it. And sometimes it's hard to look and watch so many people say no. So many people reject it in comparison to the number that say yes. That's where the riddle comes in, the conundrum, the difficult question, confusing thing that's hard to understand is why there are so few that say yes to this good news. The riddle comes in in the way Jesus responds to that, the way he answers it. And that's with these parables here in Mark Mark chapter 4. We're going to talk about those this morning, but let me tell you where it's all headed. It's all headed to a a really, really important lesson for us to get. And this is what it is. Even though it is revealed indiscriminately and it is embraced selectively, God's kingdom should be embraced immediately because, and listen to this, it's going to triumph ultimately. Now, I want to say it again, and I want, to, I want to use a little bit different terminology. Even though this gospel, this gospel is revealed indiscriminately, it's revealed broadly, and it's embraced selectively, not by everyone, but just by a few, it must be embraced. This gospel must be embraced immediately because, listen to me, it is going to triumph ultimately. And I think this is what Jesus wants to bring his followers to in this text, as well as those that hear this parable. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to look at this from the standpoint of the reasons for the parable, the reasons for kingdom parable, and then we'll look at the reception of the kingdom proclamation in the parable itself. And then we'll finish by talking about the response to the kingdom plea that's in this text of Scripture. Now, I want to do something kind of odd. 
I want to actually start in the middle of these verses that I read a moment ago. And the reason is that Mark's doing the same thing here that we talked about last week. He's using a literary device called an intercalation. You remember what that is? It basically means a sandwich or, or brackets. He, it's where he starts off talking about something like he did last week, talking about Jesus' family, and then he kind of presses pause, causes time out. He inserts this conversation with the religious leaders, and then he finishes by coming back to the story about Jesus' family. We got the same thing going on here. Mark starts off telling this parable. Jesus is telling this parable. And then he kind of calls time out before giving us the explanation, and he, and he, and he shows us this conversation that Jesus has with his, his followers, his disciples, not the whole crowd, but then he comes back to the explanation of the parable that he gives those followers. And remember, one of the things we said is one of the reasons an author would do this is to provide the key to understanding what's on both sides. And I think that's important here. So I, I, I want us to start in the middle. I want us to start with the reasons for the kingdom parable. Verses 10, 11, and 12 are where we see this, right in the middle of this text of Scripture. Now back up there in verse 1 and 2, Jesus is teaching from a boat, and he's talking to the whole crowd, mixed bag, if you will followers and then people who are just curious or people that are wanting something from him. This has got everybody, you know, there. But, but when you come to verses 10, 11, and 12, we're told that Jesus is having a, a more private conversation with his followers. Now, we don't know where exactly this took place. We don't know if in the middle of his sermon, Jesus just stops teaching and he turns around to his followers, some of his followers in the boat, and he has this conversation. It may have happened somewhere else at a different time, and Mark just inserts it in here to help us understand what is going on, but this is a private conversation. And it's here in verse 10 when it says, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. So they want to know, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you talking in these riddles? Why are you telling these stories that not everybody is understanding? And when Jesus responds to them, he basically gives them two reasons he's talking in parables. Now, there were more than two reasons for parables. Parable, in the language of the New Testament, is a word that's a compound word. It, 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 it's from one word that means alongside. It's where we get the word parallel from, something that is alongside something else. The other word is the word to place or to lay. So the idea is to place or lay something alongside in order to bring explanation or illustration. And particularly, it was the laying alongside a spiritual truth, something that people were familiar with, they had some understanding with in order to help them understand the spiritual truth. It was an illustration, an analogy, a figure, if you will. And Jesus responded to him by saying, there's two purposes, there's two reasons I'm doing it. And these may surprise you. The first one is this. He tells them that the purpose of the parables is to bring clarification to the faithful. Notice, verse 11, he said to them, to you, Remember who's he's talking about. He's alone with those who are following. They're along with the 12. To you, it has been given the secret. Maybe some of your English translations say the mystery of the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to call your attention to a couple of things. Number one, this parable is about the nature of the kingdom of God. Next week, we're going to study about two more parables that are in this chapter, and we'll see the same thing. You look at verse 26 in Mark 4, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should, thus and so. Verse 30, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? Then he gives them another parable. Now, Jesus doesn't use the term kingdom of God at the beginning of the parable of the sower, but right here in the conversation with his disciples, he lets them know this is what it's about. It's so that you will have some clarification with regard to the nature of the kingdom of God. Notice, he says, to you, it has been given the secret or the mystery. Language of the New Testament, this is a word that the apostle Paul used 21 times in his letters. It's always referring to something hidden in the Old Testament that's now revealed in the New Testament because Jesus is on the scene. Because Jesus has come, there was something that was veiled in the Old Testament 
It was, it, was, it was not out in the open, but now in the coming of Christ, it's now been revealed. The mystery has been solved. So put that together. What does Jesus say? I'm telling these parables to you, you who are people of faith, I'm telling them, so that you can understand. You can, you can be more clear about the nature of the kingdom of God, which has now been revealed. It was hidden in the Old Testament, but it's in plain sight here in the New Testament because I'm on the scene. Jesus is saying. And this is what, this is, what is, is going to happen in this passage. If you look at verse 13, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all parables? He's kind of rebuking them a little bit it, 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 right before he explains the parable to them. Don't you understand? This is for you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this so that you will have clarification. Look down at verse 33. This will be the end of next week's text. Verse 33, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Why Jesus, why Jesus talk in parables? Well, first of all, he talked to bring clarification to the faithful, people that were that were open, people that had open hearts, people who were responding to him in faith. The parables teach us something. Listen, come in here real close. They clarify things for us about the nature of God and his work, and specifically right here, the nature of his kingdom. And we get to be in on that. This is why he's doing that. But there was a second reason. Not only to bring clarification to the faithful, but watch this now. This one may surprise you, to bring condemnation to the faithless. To bring condemnation to the faithless. Notice the middle of verse 11. Jesus introduces his contrast. He's just said to you it's been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, outside of what, you say? Outside of the kingdom. People on the outside looking in. But for those on the outside, everything is in parables. Why? He tells us in verse 12. So that, and he draws on an illustration going back 700 years. Seven centuries to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He quotes there and says, So that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. And say, so, well, what's that about? Some of you are familiar with Isaiah's call. 700 years prior to this time, God gives Isaiah a vision of himself. He's high and lifted up, and you got all these angels, angelic beings worshiping and ministering around the throne. Isaiah's under conviction, one of the one of the ministering spirits picks a coal up off the fire, touches Isaiah's lips, and he's cleansed. There's this, there's this repentant, cleansing worship experience going on. And then God asks a question. He says, who will go for us? Who should I send to the people? Well, as you can imagine, Isaiah raises his hand. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> the sin's been dealt with. I'm ready to go. I'm yours. Send me. God's words are interesting. They're these words. He basically says to Isaiah, okay, Isaiah, I want you to go, but let me just tell you up front, nobody's going to listen to you. How's that for a new vocation? How's that for a start of a new job? Can you imagine being hired by a company and the, you know, the employer says, so we're so glad to have you on board, glad to have you on the team. Let me just tell you up front, you're going to totally fail at this, at least by the standard that most pe people would measure success. And by the way, it's exactly what happened in Isaiah's ministry throughout Israel, proclaiming God's message, and most of the people said no. Most of the people said no, but let me tell you what God's telling him right here. Isaiah, I'm doing this for a reason. Because the more you preach my word, the more you proclaim what I say, and the more people resist, the harder their hearts are going to become. And your ministry, just in the doing of it, is going to be a pronouncement of my judgment on people who refuse to soften their heart but continue 
to say no. By the way, this, this ought to draw our attention back to chapter 3, right? In that whole unpardonable sin thing. If you were here last week, you remember what Jesus said. Every, every blasphemy somebody speaks will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And it'll separate him from God with eternity. And we talked about the reality of the continual saying no, the continual resistance, the continual hardening. Well, guess what? Isaiah's ministry seven centuries before and Jesus' parables right here in the first century were serving that purpose. They were serving the purpose of, of bringing clarification for the people who are responding in faith, but for the people who were continuing to say no, who continued to resist, who continued to harden their heart, that message was continuing to sear their lostness. Have you ever, you ever had somebody that, you know, maybe somebody talking to a child or maybe one of your children talking to one of their siblings or, you know, somebody that's just pushing and pushing and pushing and a person is unconvinced, a child's just continuing to resist, and you say, stop pushing them because it's, you're just making it worse. And you're saying that from a negative standpoint, knowing if this person continues to drive, continues to push, it's just going to make that person harder and harder. Well, guess what? Jesus uses that exact same thing positively, positively in the sense of accomplishing his purposes. And he says, I'm telling these parables for you. They bring clarification to the kingdom, and I'm going to help you out with that. But for people that are, are faithless and continuing to resist, these parables are going to be nothing more that riddles that confuse them and cause them to be harder and harder and harder to the message. That's why Jesus was telling parables. I don't want you to forget that, by the way, when you share the gospel and people say no. On the surface, in the standards of the way most people measure success, we're failures because more people are saying, no, it's not a good business model. The return on the investment is not very good, it seems. By most people's standards, they would have us to believe, why do you keep doing that? You ought to just quit because most people are not listening. But I want you to understand by virtue of what Jesus says right here, God, even in the resistance of people to your witness and mine, is accomplishing his sovereign purposes. He is doing something in the invisible realm that you and I don't have any control over and are not always privy to with regard to the naked eye. But by faith, according to the testimony of Jesus, God is sovereignly accomplishing his purposes. And we need to be encouraged by that. So this is the reasons for the kingdom parables. Let's go back now and let's look at the parable Jesus has told in this setting. And I want you to see the reception, or we might say lack thereof, the reception of the kingdom proclamation. I think that's what's going on in this parable of the sower. Now what I want to do is I want to kind of do a back and forth thing real quick. We really can move through this pretty quickly because I, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining it to you. Why? Because Jesus explains it. He tells the parable to the old crowd in verses 3 through 8, but he explains the parable to his disciples in verses 14 through 20. So what I want to do is I want to jump on both sides of this sandwich going through this so that we can see what he says it's about. It's obviously about a sower sowing seed. That's what we see in verse 3. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, we're not told who the sower is. That's pretty implicit in the passage of Scripture. If this is about God's kingdom and the unfolding of it, then obviously that started with God. He's the one that is revealing this in Christ Jesus. But next week when we look at the other two parables, it will, it, you know, it, it'll help us to understand that really this is anybody that sows this seed. You and I are extensions of God in the revelation of his kingdom and, 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 and his witnesses. And so certainly that includes us. Now we are told what, what the, the seed is. Sower went out to sow this seed. Look down or across the page or the next page at verse 14. The sower sows the, what does it say? 
the word, right? So Jesus tells us what this seed is that he's talking about. Now, be careful because you might say, well, I know what that is. That's the Bible. And and to some degree, you would be correct. But let me remind you, the people that heard this would have never had that thought. Why? Because they didn't have a book with 66 books in it, leather bound or hard bound or electronic copy, you know, of this thing that we call the Bible. We've got to ask the question, what would this have meant to them? What would they have understood it to be? And what they would have understood it to be is this message that Jesus has been proclaiming. Remember in chapter 1 and verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news of God, and say, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What is the word? What is the message that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about the arrival of God's kingdom in him that he is now making available and making accessible. And he uses the synonym gospel, good news. This is good news. And this is what Jesus was proclaiming. This is the message that he was giving. Interestingly, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul refers to the word of the truth as the gospel. And he even goes on to say, it is being sown throughout the whole world and it is bearing fruit and growing. Same image, same idea. So when we look at this and we ask, okay, well, what's going on here? Somebody is spreading, is speaking the word of the arrival of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. We know of it as the gospel. So that's what's going on. There are four degrees of reception of this gospel message that are indicated in this passage of Scripture. Let me tell you what they are real quickly. First of all, the compact ground of callousness. The compact ground of, of callousness. Now, you see, they, they, they farmed a little bit differently than we farm today. Most of the time today, what we would do would be plow a field or a farmer would plow a field and then he would plant the seed and cover it up, water it, fertilize it, wait for it to grow. Well, they kind of did it in reverse. In that day and time, the first thing they did was spread the seed. So they would go out and spread it indiscriminately, broadly, and then they would come back with what we think about with a plow, kind of a pointed stick sometimes, and they would, they would kind of stir up the ground. They would plow it and overturn, cover up some of the seed. And consequently, if there was any gap between sowing and plowing, guess what happened? Well, this is what happened. The seed fell on different kinds of ground, all of the kinds that Jesus mentions here. And the first thing he talks about, the first kind of ground, is this pathway that represents the compact ground of callousness. He says, as he sowed in verse 4, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. You know how this is. If you've planted seeds, if you planted some bushes or plants or a garden of some type, you have, to, you have to protect what you've planted from predators, from animals, and particularly birds that might swoop down and, and, and get into it. Let me show you what Jesus is saying. Look, look at verse 15. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown when they hear when they hear. Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And they didn't have kind of the neat farmland and the lot, you know, that's all plowed up, kind of like we see. They had fields out there anywhere, and and those fields were traversed with paths that people walked on, sometimes on the outside, sometimes right through the middle. And the more people walked on them, guess what? The harder they got. Became like concrete. And so when they did that broad distribution, guess what? There's some seed that would fall on that concrete, that hard ground, and it was just right there, and the birds could see it. They'd swoop down, take it away. Jesus says this is exactly what Satan does with seed that falls, listen, on calloused hearts, hearts that are hard from the very outset. They're resistant. They say no. The second... The second kind of soil is the stony ground of suffering. See it in verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. So instead of being able to go down and roots go deep, it, 
it responds and reacts by, by coming up quickly. Not always a good sign. Verse 6, when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Jesus explains this one in verses 16 and 17. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. You know anybody like that? You ever seen that happen? Somebody raises a hand in a worship service like this. They walk an aisle during an altar call. They pray a prayer. They fill out a card. They go through a baptistry. They sign up to become a church member, and they're excited, and everybody's excited with them. But after some period of time, they disappear. The joy is gone. The enthusiasm is no more, and they fall away. Jesus explains it. You have no root. Seed hasn't taken root. And so they endure for a while. Notice it in verse 17. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word. What's he say? When it becomes hard to be a Christian. When you start getting pushback. People start laughing at you. People break up with you. They walk out on you. They don't let you in your circle of friends. They're, they're, they're slandering you. When the reality of the gospel life or the gospel professed life begins to rub against people's lives in this world, the attack begins. Now, please understand that Jesus is not saying here that these people were once genuine, authentic Christians and then they lost it or they just stop professing it. There's only one kind of soil among these four that represents authentic salvation, and this is not one of them. Why am I telling you that? Because you see, we want so badly to believe this is different. Some of us have people in our families. I do. In our circle of friends, people we love, people we're close to, that this happened to. An initial profession with joy and celebration, but when we put our heads on our pillows at night, we know that we know there's been no fruit and there is no life of fruit, of any evidence of it whatsoever. We want to go to the funeral of loved ones, regardless of how they've lived, and we want the preacher to tell us that that person is in heaven, that they made it. Because they filled out a card, they prayed a prayer, they, they signed up at some point. But there was never any fruit in their lives that indicated authenticity. The third response is similar, the third kind of ground. I call this the thorny ground of worldliness. Verse 7 other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Once again, no fruit. Look at verses 18 and 19. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is not about suffering or persecution. This is about the person who really never lets go of the world and at some point just decides that's more value than this gospel that maybe they initially profess. And they're more interested in position. They're more interested in power. They're more interested in stuff. They're more interested in career. They're more interested in retirement. They're more interested in, in, in building a family. They're, they're more interested in all of the things in this life for their own sake. This is not somebody that denies the gospel and says, I don't want it. This is just somebody that says, yeah, I want that gospel thing. I want my sins forgiven, and I want to know I'm going to heaven, but I don't want it in any way to infringe upon my pursuit of all this stuff in this world. And I want you to hear our Lord who says very clearly, it proves unfruitful. And then finally... Finally, there is the fertile ground of faith. 
This is the only one, by the way, that the farmer wants. This is the reason he plants the crop. It's the reason he sows the seed. Verse 8, and other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. Now, even before we look at the explanation, let me tell you something right here. This is, this is the first place in the parable that people would have been surprised. There's not anything that's happened up this that anybody in the crowd wouldn't have been familiar with. They understood how the sowing process and the plowing process were, and they understood how seed fell on these different types of soil, even the fertile soil. But when Jesus mentioned the 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, there would have been a lot of jaws that dropped in the crowd. And here's why. In ancient Palestine, the average produce, the average yield of a crop would have been somewhere between six to eight, maybe on an off-the-chart year, a ten-fold crop that came. That's what they would have been used to. And all of a sudden, Jesus is telling the story, stuff they're very familiar with, and he gets to this point and says this. And this, beloved believer in Jesus Christ, come in here real close. Hear this explanation. Go over there and see what Jesus says in verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. Look at it. Language of the New Testament. Welcome it. Receive it. This is the first time this has been mentioned in any of these soils. They accept it, they embrace it, they receive it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. You know, sometimes people come to this parable and they want it to be about the soils. They want it to be about these, oh, we got to figure out where's the best soil and where's the hard soil, where's the low-hanging fruit. I want you to understand that's not your job, it's not my job. Others look and say, man, how do we adjust the seed and, you know, make it just right and the presentation and how do we do the stuff that's really going to get people's attention and really going to entertain people and draw them in and, 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 you know, so that we can really share the gospel with them. We understand that none of that is here and this parable is not even focused on the soils other than to say most people are going to reject the message. What it ultimately is to get us to this yield and to say we can't even imagine the fruit that the kingdom of God is going to produce in its triumph. But remember what Jesus is doing. He's speaking to this conundrum, this question that you have and I have sometimes and some of these people have. Why? If this is such good news that we have, why are so few people accepting it? And he wants to say to his followers, Listen, the kingdom is going to be met and the gospel message is going to be met with difficulty and it's going to be met with lots of rejection, what seems like more rejection than acceptance. But don't you ever underestimate the ultimate triumph of the kingdom that you proclaim. It is going to produce a crop like you've never, ever seen before. It's going to triumph. I don't think Jesus is talking here particularly about numbers. Oh, before your lifetime is up, you're going to see this great revival. I pray that happens. I pray it happens in my lifetime. I love when we see, you know, particular movements of God here and there. But remember, this is about the nature of the kingdom. And the kingdom is not ultimately going to be manifest fully until what happens? Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, beloved, listen. Listen. When he comes back, the kingdom is going to be manifested ultimately as the triumphant kingdom. And that's the gospel that you share, and it's the gospel that I share. What do we take away from this, believers in Christ, who get this explanation? Sow it. Sow it everywhere. Sow it to everybody. Sow it on every place of the planet. Brainer, do what you're doing. Find ways to get it to every place under the sun and sow the seed in your household, on your ball teams, at your work, every place you can in this community and beyond. Keep sowing the seed. You don't have to analyze it. You don't have to figure out how it works. Your job is to sow the seed. And when you find yourself asking the question, why are so few people responding? 
Why are so few people saints? Remember this. Remember that the sovereign God is using your testimony even when people say no to accomplish his purposes. And remember that this kingdom that you're telling people about is ultimately going to triumph. And that's why we finish with a response to this kingdom plea. Do you notice how Jesus bookended his actual telling of the parable to the whole crowd with an appeal? Verse 3, listen. Language of the New Testament, it's an imperative command, means do this. It, it's talking about hearing. It's a word that's used 10 times in this chapter alone. Mark 4 alone. Listen, hear, and it implies embrace, heed. And then he couples that with the word behold. Mark never does that another time in his gospel, and it's never done another time either in Mark's gospel or any other gospel to introduce a parable. You put those two words together, and it puts it in bold. It highlights it. It underscores, and it, 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 it says this is huge. This is important. Do this. Do this now. Remember who he's talking to. Verse 9, he who has ears to hear, hear. Let him hear. If you're able to understand this, you see, this is a plea, beloved, that's not to believers in Jesus Christ, but it's to those of you in the room today or are watching online or may hear this message by recording who've, who've, who've at this point not said yes. You've not embraced Christ. You've not repented of your sins. You've not placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I would say to you. Here's my plea to you. It's Jesus' plea. If this makes sense to you, in this moment, in this hour, if what Jesus has explained and what we've talked about, if you can see that and see that, I, I, that makes sense, then beloved, let me plead with you to say yes to it now. To say yes to it now. If you have ears to hear, hear it. Hear it now and say yes to it. And I would say to you right where you're seated, wherever you are, in your heart of arts, in your own words, Turn your attention not to me anymore, not to this event, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell him you know you're a sinner and you're on the outside looking in of God's kingdom, but you know that he came to die for your sins and rise from the dead to give you the chance to be a part of the family of God. Ask him to forgive your sin and become the king of your life. I plead with you, do that today. Do it today. You may have been coming or watching for a long time now. You may have walked in here or turned this program on for the, for the first time today. It doesn't matter if this makes sense. And God, by his grace, has given you hearing ears today. Say yes to it. I plead with you to do that. Believers in Christ, we respond by sowing this seed, this message to everybody, everywhere. And we do it with the confidence that God is sovereignly working regardless of people's response, using us to accomplish his purpose. And we do it encouraged to know that the message we proclaim is the one that is ultimately going to triumph.